cloudy with a few showers until tomorrow morning. It's almost seven minutes past five. And you're with Checkpoint. We will be with you for the next hour. My name's Lisa Owen. The world has seen its first glimpse of the man police say is responsible for the terror attack. 28-year-old Brenton Harrison Tarrant appeared in the Christchurch District Court just before 11 o'clock this morning. Our court reporter, Annika Smith, was there. And a few minutes ago, I asked her about that court appearance. Well, Lisa, it was a very tense but very brief hearing at the Christchurch District Court this morning. The accused entered the dock in a, a white gown. It was made of thick material and his hands were handcuffed in front of him and he had a cut to his upper lip. Now, he um, surveyed the courtroom from left to right several times. He took in the public gallery. It was packed with local and international media. Uh, he seemed very calm in his demeanour. Uh, possibly smug and he seemed to enjoy the attention that he was getting from all of those journalists that packed the public gallery. Did he speak at all? He didn't say anything throughout the entire appearance. He seemed very, very quiet, um, quite subdued and he just stood silently between um, two police officers. How would you describe security there? Was it beefed up for the appearance? Security was very, very high. Um, from about 8.30 in the morning, journalists arrived at the courthouse and we were waiting um, to hear when we would be able to get in. When we were ushered in eventually, only accredited media was allowed through the security screening. No public was allowed. We were ushered uh, in groups of six up to level um, three of the courthouse into courtroom 12. And in there, there would have been a dozen security staff, more than, more than is normal, that's for sure. So what actually happened during this brief appearance? So the man appeared before Judge uh, Paul Keller and the court heard that one murder charge had been laid. He was charged with murdering someone who we can't name because the judge made an interim suppression order on that victim's name in respect to their family. We heard that the one murder charge had been laid, but it's likely that many more, or some more, will be. Um, he did not apply for bail, so he was remanded in custody, and he also didn't seek interim name suppression, so we were able to name him after today's appearance. And he will appear again, not for some time, April, is that right? Yeah, April. Just as a matter of course, he would normally appear um, for a murder charge in the district court and it will be bumped up to the high court. So he's due to appear in the high court at Christchurch on the 5th of April. There was another interesting development too, wasn't there, Annika, which is a Christchurch teenager who, who is now before the court as well. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so while I was going through the charging documents for the day, I also found another charging document in relation to this 18-year-old um, teenager who was from Christchurch. Now, he has been charged with, under the Human Rights Act, um, with intent to excite hostility against people in New Zealand by publishing written material, which is insulting. Now, we don't yet know if this is linked to yesterday's shooting, um, and police haven't confirmed that, but he is due to appear um, in, back in the Christchurch District Court on Monday, so we're hoping to find out more then. And that's our court reporter, Annika Smith, who was at the appearance this morning of Brenton Tarrant. The police now say it appears the shootings in Christchurch... Shut up. ...they um, dying before they arrived. Those injured ranged in ages from the very young to quite elderly patients. Greg Robertson says it is very unusual for local surgeons to deal with gunshot wounds, and certainly on this scale. As you would expect, uh, the wounds from gunshots are often quite uh, significant. We have had patients with injuries to most parts of the body uh, that range from relatively superficial soft tissue injuries to more complex injuries involving the chest, the abdomen, the pelvis, the long bones and the head. Craig Robertson says the staff also had to deal with operating while being watched over by armed police, yeah, right. as there were concerns that the hospital could also become a target. 
uh, we were uh, in a lockdown situation. We had the police, uh, armed police, all around the hospital. It's, a, it's an environment uh, that we're... Shut the fuck up. Please pray for my son, for, for me, and for my daughter. Hopefully she will be so much better. Okay. And I'm just posting this video to show you that I am fully okay. Okay, guys? Well, it's been a pleasure to know you all, guys. Thank you for all the support and all the help. I'm sure you'll be playing basketball tomorrow. That was mosque shooting victim Wasim al Sati speaking from his Christchurch hospital bed earlier today. The Prime Minister has ordered a sweeping review of laws ranging from border security, how watch lists are managed, to firearms licensing. She has two other pressing questions. Jacinda Dern has asked for assurances Brenton Tarrant had done nothing before the attack that should have put him on the radar of law enforcement agencies and that any concerns raised by Christchurch's Muslim community are dealt with properly. Our political editor, Jane Patterson, joins us now from Parliament. Jane, a big focus on gun laws. What could happen with the law change there? Well, Jacinda Ardern at her briefing at Parliament this morning making no bones about the fact that the government will change the firearms law and probably that would mean the licensing regime and the penalties regime as well. So more information coming out from okay. Commissioner Mike Bush today about the weaponry and the licence um, of uh, Brenton Tarrant. And he said that he actually had a Category A or a standard firearms licence. Um, RNZ's been told by a Dunedin sports store that he bought a rifle there. It wasn't a semi-automatic and Commissioner Mike Bush was saying that it he could have altered it to turn it into a semi-automatic weapon, which would be illegal to use under his under the licence that he actually had. So um, a couple of years ago, in 2017, a parliamentary committee spent about a year looking into illegal firearms in New Zealand. They came back with 20 recommendations. The police minister at the time, Paula Bennett, picked up seven of those. They included bringing in firearm prohibition orders, reviewing penalties in the Act, and also making it harder for gang members to get firearms. But among the recommendations that were rejected included requiring the police to record serial numbers of all firearms upon renewal renewal of licence or inspection. And that's a big debate, whether owners themselves should be licensed or whether individual guns should be registered, and also requiring a licence to possess ammunition, and also looking at the creation of a new category for semi-automatic uh, rifles and shotguns. Now, Jacinda Ardern today indicating that it's quite possible they will look to ban semi-automatic weapons altogether. Now, uh, the Issues traversed in this report are very likely to be the ones that officials are looking at now, but obviously there's going to be a lot more urgency and a greater appetite to get on and make these changes. Yeah, well, how big do you think that appetite is? As you point out, we've only not so long ago had this review and uh, the national government, the then national government, basically discarded a number of the recommendations. Have you had an opportunity to sort of canvas who's going to get in behind this? Look, all we can go on is what happened back in 2017. Now, the hunting lobby has been very strong in its lobbying. It argues that uh, these changes wouldn't help the illegal weapon problem in New Zealand, that actually it would target and it would disadvantage people who are already willing and following the law, um, people like farmers and hunters who are already in the system, and it wouldn't help do anything about illegal firearms or firearms that had sort of dropped off the radar. Now, on the other hand, you have the police who have really been pushing hard for changes that they want to lock down and clamp down on gun use, including being able to track those in individual weapons. Now, I imagine those uh, different sides haven't changed, but obviously in this environment, um, the views of those opposed to it may not hold so much strength in the current climate when we have an incident like this. But that's when the government really has to weigh... Um, making law changes in a, in a knee-jerk, responsive, reactive fashion as opposed to really looking at what's going to be good law. We have a national security threat level which is high at the moment, but what has the Prime Minister signalled about more long-term changes? So 
the national security threat level basically means that um, border control and border checks and anything security related can really be boosted up high and there doesn't need to be a regulation or a law change to do that but of course that's a temporary measure but what Ms Ardern has indicated today is that she wants officials to look at all of those areas on a longer term basis. Are the checks at the border strong enough? Um, are the, is the information sharing with Australia doing what it needs to? And she's also asking some very pointed questions about that watch list and that security alert process that the intelligence agencies use. Remember that um, Brent and Tarrant and none of the people in custody had come to the attention of intelligence agencies. So Jacinda Ardern has asked officials to go and look not only at what had happened... Another country bites the fucking dust with the guns. All that's going to be left is the government with guns as they blow our fucking brains out. Panic Gardens, where people are coming to lay floral tributes. He is with us via a live view. Hi, Logan. Make sure you brainwash the kids. As you said, we're here outside the Botanic Gardens. Uh, in the middle of a city which can only be described as heartbroken uh, more than 24 hours after those two deadly shootings yesterday afternoon that claimed the lives of 49 people. We're here in a crowd of a couple of hundred who have been coming thick and fast all day, dropping tributes off along the front wall of the Botanic Gardens. Those tributes have come in all forms. There are thousands of flowers, bouquets of flowers behind me of all colours, personal notes saying uh, we, are, we stand with you, we are with you, we do not accept this, this is not us. Those have been tied to the uh, to the fence behind me. Uh, ferns strapped to the fence as well. Flags, banners, anything that Christchurch residents can do to show that they support our Muslim brothers and sisters is, is here behind me along the front wall of the Botanic Gardens. You can see the grief etched on the faces of everyone here today, whether they are Muslim or not. This is something that cuts all of us incredibly deeply. Of course, down the road at the moment, our, uh, our Muslim community are also um, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, they, they've been uh, debriefed and are now trying to figure out what their, what their next moves are. There is obviously a loss of heartbreak down that way. I actually spoke to the son of the imam at the Linwood Mosque where oh, okay. and that I should call my parents uh, and check up on them. Sucker, didn't we? Um, we are all people, no matter the colour, creed or religion. And that's just one of hundreds that licence in November 2017, even after a police background check into whether he was a fit and proper person. Phil Pennington reports. The accused was active online before the attack, posting on social media sites. He had five guns, including two semi-automatics and a shotgun. The National Rifle Association's Nicole McKee says she's surprised, given the views he expressed online, that he had a firearms licence. We expect that police will investigate thoroughly how that came about and will look at their own internal processes around that. She says the association does not know how Brenton Tarrant got his five guns. He had been living in Dunedin. A sports store there, Hunting and Fishing New Zealand, says it has a record of selling a bolt action rifle to a licence holder called Brenton Tarrant in 2017, but not any semi-automatics. Dunedin's two other gun stores would not talk to RNZ about any possible purchases, with one manager saying he could check, but it was up to the police to say. An Auckland firearms lawyer, Nicholas Taylor, says the police do not look at the online activity of a firearms licence applicant unless either of their two referees raise it as an issue. Unless that person or those people do, then the police just don't have the resources. To do that. He says the referee's check doesn't take into account whether the two people put forward share similar views with the applicant. That is one of the issues that has to be looked at. That would have been obvious when they designed the system, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, we're looking at the Arms Act from 1983. Nicholas Taylor says he's raised what he sees as this weakness in the firearms licensing system with the police and government over several years. It was sort of either not having enough resources or sort of it's in the too hard basket, and also the resistance from the Minister of Police or Parliament to, to change the law. Communications consultant Paul Brislin says Brenton Tarrant was very active online and not hidden within the dark web. He seems to have been pretty public uh, with regard to what he was saying prior to the attack, so you would hope that would have triggered uh, at least some automated services.
Paul Brislin wants an inquiry, even a Royal Commission of Inquiry, into what's gone on. The National Rifle Association says an inquiry is needed to answer the questions around online vetting. Martin Cocker of online safety group NetSafe says how well police vet an individual's online activity needs looking into. NetSafe will expect a, a pretty thorough review of all aspects of the use of online information to inform and prevent tragedies like this. Uh, you know, we would expect that to be something that will happen in the near future. They also say it is not only when referees raise an issue that they check on online activity. For Checkpoint, Phil Pennington. Messages of love, hope and support for the Muslim community are ringing out at vigils and mosques around the country today. Mosques remain closed in the wake of the Christchurch attacks, but piles of flowers have been placed in front of shut gates along with signs, cards and candles. Peace vigils have been planned around the country for the coming days. Hamilton later tonight, Nelson and Wellington tomorrow and Dunedin on Thursday. They kicked off in Auckland's Altair Square today and Checkpoint reporter Nita Blake person and cameraman Nick Monroe were there. Kia ora Lisa, yeah, I am here above Altair Square looking down where there's about 2,000 people gathered. The count was about 2,000 half an hour ago and they just keep pouring in families, people from all communities, religions, races, walks of life. They're here to show their support. Many of them have brought placards. The overwhelming message is aroha love, support and total intolerance for racism. They've bought flowers, they're laying those up on stage and um, it's a beautiful scene down there where speakers are sharing messages of hope and unity at this time. Some of those speakers have included MPs from the Green Party, National, Labour, we've had the Auckland Mayor Phil Goff all showing support for uh, everyone in Christchurch but also the Muslim communities across the country. We've also had uh, a performance from the Auckland Choir, they had an emotional condition of Stand By Me, which really seems to have summed up the mood here today, everyone supporting one another at this time. There is a, a heavy police presence, dozens of officers and additional security dotted throughout the crowd. They are here obviously working and there was a focus on, on safety and what people would need to do if there was any event, but a lot of those officers are also here uh, participating. They're hugging the crowd and uh, showing their support during this peace vigil at this time. We spoke to quite a few members of the crowd earlier and Here's some of their messages. I am also a former refugee who came to New Zealand from uh, Bosnia and uh, have been through ethnic cleansing. And it just shook me to pieces that, that something like this could happen in New Zealand where I came to took refuge. It's not just a Muslim community which is here. If you look around, it's basically every, every race is here to sort of address the situation. This could, this could have happened anywhere. It could happen out open in a cafeteria. So it's, it's just good to see that everyone's coming together and addressing the situation. It was really important for me as a young black Muslim woman to be here today and to speak. And I think, you know, just having the opportunity of being surrounded not just by Muslims, but everyday New Zealanders is actually part of the healing process. And I think to hear from the different voices is actually really quite important at this moment in time. For New Zealanders in general, you know, like just getting together to show that we do respect all cultures and all religions. It doesn't matter who you are, but yeah, we're just here to support you because this is these are our people, and that's what I'm here for, and for my family and for everyone else's family. Today, I will not be graceful and I will not be articulate, and for that, I apologise in advance. But my heart is broken, and I am feeling equal parts of grief and equal parts anger. And I will not apologize for my anger. Quite numb until probably now. And uh, you know, and just looking at all of these people here and seeing the shared sense of, of loss and grief and loss of innocence, right? We hoped, we prayed, this day would never reach the shores of Aotearoa. But talking to many Muslims across New Zealand, there were many of us who braced ourselves for this. In the next coming weeks, I know that we'll have a lot of difficult yet courageous conversations, and I think we need to we need to make sure that we have them. We can't sweep it under the carpet and pretend that it doesn't exist. She'll be right is not the attitude that we um, that we need to take with this, and so it, it needs to be taken seriously. 
And those were voices from the Peace, Peace March at Altair Square. Nick Munro and our uh, reporter, Nita Blake Person, were there. That piece will be up online if you're listening and want to go and look at some of the pictures. As the enormity of yesterday's massacre sinks in, people have been rallying around the country to show support for the Muslim community at mosques around New Zealand. It was a sombre atmosphere at the Wellington Islamic Centre as people of all ages and backgrounds laid flowers at the locked gates and covered the footpath with chalk messages of solidarity and love. Nuruddin Abdul Rahma came hoping to find a safe place to pray. But when he saw the outpouring of support, he was moved to give an emotional address to the crowd. I want the world to see it. This is New Zealanders. You just touched me inside. And all I want to say is nice. thank you very much, New Zealand. I will always remember. This is, this is very touching, I'm telling you. I just... I'm out of words. Thank you very much. I don't even know why I was crying. It just broke me. I just, yeah, I just break down. All those New Zealanders standing here, all from two years old girls to 18, some of them really old people here supporting us means a lot for me. And I was walking this way, people giving me a hug. This is really incredible things for me. We were naive to think it would never, something like this would never happen, but it still seems completely shocking. Maybe we have become complacent. Um, but yeah, I still think there's so much we don't know about the motivations and where this guy came from. It's just just so hard to, to yeah, put the pieces together. Well, it's heartening to see um, so many tributes left here. I think it's just part of trying to process what's happened. We just can't. I to ask someone to call, can you check the door? Like, is the door locked? You know, I never did that. I always opened the door. I love the wind and the sun. And now I have to lock my door. They really took away that safety from us. For my kids to come, we've been here like for 18 years. And for my kids to come and tell me, is it okay for me to go to the city tomorrow? Is it, is it, I'm, I, is, I'm safe, uh, you know? Uh, it was heartbreaking. I'm hoping like in the future we'll get back that security and that, but for now, sorry. We don't. And I'm sure that many of the Muslim community are feeling the same. It is eight minutes away from six. I'm Lisa Owen, and you're listening to a Checkpoint special on RNZ National. We're keen for your feedback. You can get in touch on the text 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ, or you can email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Don't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck for a while. End the fucking episode of this. Unless more stupid shit comes 